everybody out there, you're tuned in to 91.8 The Fan. You're in my corner, and I have a very special guest in the corner who has dashingly arrived at just the nick of time. Would you like to introduce yourself to everybody out there? Hi, folks. I'm Vince Carrazza. <laughs> and we know you uh, from many different roles. I know there are a few fangirls in the audience who are going crazy over your Kingdom Hearts role. But we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. <laughs> right on. I am sort of curious, though, because I was looking, you know, through everything. You were born in, in Canada, but I was kind of yep. curious why you made the big move to Los Angeles. What was the big push that made you do that? Um, I uh, had uh, worked a lot for almost 10 years up in uh, Toronto and in all, or, all over Canada, but that's where I'm originally from. And uh, I kind of felt like I had reached the ceiling, um, you know, in terms of, how much further I could go. I was working, uh, was working nonstop and, uh, you know, well known and, uh, getting my pick of roles. And, and I just felt like, you know, the logical next step in a career is to, uh, see if the little fish can make it in a bigger pond. So, uh, I decided to move to Los Angeles and, uh, I mean, this is where most of everything is done. Uh, although the, you know, the, our industry, the entertainment industry has become so much more global as, demonstrated by you and I speaking to each other on Skype um, while I'm in California and you're in Las Vegas. So, Lovely technology. Uh, yes, yes. I now have my own home recording studio that's uh, fully soundproof with state-of-the-art equipment that I do live sessions to anywhere uh, at any time. Um, and sometimes literally to places that are just down the street that I could drive to in 10 minutes, but we're just too lazy and so we hook up from home studios. Uh, that's just, you know, what modern technology has done. But uh, back when I made the move um, almost 10 years ago, I felt like I wanted to come here and see if I could make it to Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, I think it's worked out pretty good. <laughs> I would say so. I would definitely say so. And I'm kind of curious, obviously, how you got your start in voice acting. Ah, that's interesting. I, uh, well, I, Hmm. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go on the journey, the long journey. Might as well make it a long story. Montage. <laughs> exactly. We're going back in time. <laughs> um, I, uh, as a kid, I was a huge cartoon freak and watched everything known to man. And my favorite cartoon of all was Scooby Doo. And I would just imitate stuff when I heard it. Um, and uh, I had no clue that there was even an industry in it. I mean, other than the fact that I wanted to be an actor. And as I started to pursue acting, I heard about voiceovers. I'd heard about, you know, performers. And, you know, you hear about legends like Casey Kasem, who was Shaggy and Robin and uh, in the Batman and Robin stuff. And, you know, but I, I never really thought about it. For me, the main pursuit in my career was always to be uh, a theater or a film and television actor. Um, and then I went to Ryerson Theater School in Toronto, which was Ryerson University. I went to the theater department there and, and start to study acting. And in second year, we uh, had a microphone technique class. And um, I had no idea what that was. I remember seeing it on the schedule thinking, microphone technique? What, are we going to learn how to hold a mic on stage or something? Or I didn't realize what they were referring to. When we got into the class, we had an amazing teacher named Roland Parliament, who you guys might be familiar with. He's done directed tons of animation um, and uh, and performed in tons of stuff, too. And he was our teacher for two years and uh, introduced me to the world of voiceover uh, performing. And um, uh, and from there, I just I just took to it naturally. Uh, and uh, as soon as I graduated from Ryerson, I literally booked my very first voiceover audition which was the uh, MasterCard commercial. <laughs> um, and then from there, it just took off. Uh, but uh, I had no clue. I, I hadn't really planned on getting into voiceover. It wasn't something that I'd thought through. It just kind of, you know, I, I was so lucky. I, I thank my stars, you know, that that, uh, I, that that course was just something that uh, was part of our curriculum. And, uh, and so I got amazing training in it. We just had hours and hours every week in studios with Roland would bring in, you know, very successful performers from animation, from commercials, narration, promos, you name it, uh, trailer work. And so we just got to learn from the best. We got to play around on state of the art equipment and, you know, so 
when I entered the professional world and got an agent, I was ready to go. Um, and, uh, you know, you it hit was the ground incredibly, running. Lucky, incredibly <laughs> fortunate. So I would say that uh, that would be the pre-lazy <laughs> because, <laughs> because you kind of got to, uh, you know, go to auditions and whatnot in, in your PJs. But now you can just stay at home and, and try on your little on, on your studio. Oh, we might have a slight lag uh, probably Hello? going on here. Hello. <laughs> hey, did you guys get that? Uh, yeah, we got we got most of it uh, all all up uh, till the end. So I was actually asking you the next question. So I think uh, we're doing a okay. <laughs> yeah, we must have had a drop out there. That's weird. I finished my story and then there was nothing. I was like, oh, <laughs> I, think, I thought I I bored them. They were so <laughs> bored that they they turned off and we all away. fell asleep. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but that was what I was saying is that's sort of a. Uh, voice acting was sort of the pre-lazy in terms of you could go to work in your pajamas and nobody would know. <laughs> but yeah, now uh, you can stay home and, and be in your studio. Yeah, I literally have. I remember when I my very first uh, session from my studio after I built it, built it at the house uh, on purpose. I used to be um, the corporate voice for Mazda um, for about four years until um, uh, Dr. McDreamy, uh, took my job away uh, <laughs> from uh, Grey's Anatomy, um, and uh, so when I built my studio, we it was uh, it was Donor was the ad agency in Chicago, and they always wanted or Detroit, sorry, they were in Detroit, Michigan, and so they would always want to start at like 9 a.m. in the morning their time, which was 6 a.m. my time on the West Coast. Uh, and so I used to have to drive to studios in Hollywood at like 5 a.m. in the morning to do a oh session. God. I know. It was crazy. And so my very first Mazda session that I did for them from my home studio when we hooked up, uh, I on purpose was in my boxer shorts with I, like I didn't even brush my teeth. I had a cup of coffee in my hand and we built a window in the studio so that like if ever, you know, my wife or I are recording, we have like equipment on the other side. So you could also actually bring in a professional engineer to do the session. And uh, so through the window, as I was recording, she took a picture of me and it's a hilarious photo because my hair is all messed up. I look like, I look like I'm literally going to bed or <laughs> not even getting up and I'm recording a session for Mazda from my home studio. It was awesome. Well, see, I don't think that's a bad thing. If it makes you feel any nope. better. <laughs> it's awesome. I, I get up sometimes and I'll I'll still be in like my big sh big t-shirt and my shorts <laughs> when I do this. Yeah. It's great. It's great. That's the uh, you know it's that old joke. You've got a face that's perfect for radio. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Because <laughs> you don't have to worry when you're on the radio. It doesn't matter what you look like. Or when you're on, you know, it's just voiceover. And so uh, yeah, having a home studio is awesome. There's it's it's great. There's don't nothing like. Up, don't have to worry about this. <laughs> No, I did a session yesterday. Uh, we weren't, we didn't hook up live. I actually just, because it's for people that I've worked for a million times. And so they just sent me the copy and said, Hey, here's the timing. Can you record it and MP3 it to us? And so I ran into the studio, did it in about 20 minutes. And then as soon as I was finished, I was out in my backyard and I jumped in my pool. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So it's like, yeah, no, it's awesome. <laughs> Well, obviously, I, I have to ask just because it's uh, always a wonder for fans, for someone who's been in the industry as long as you have. You actually got to do a lot of um, anime dubbing. And were you aware of what anime was at the time? Um, yeah, I mean, I was aware of it um, because I had already been auditioning for stuff before I would got my very first uh, big gig. Um, and I'd done little bits here and there. Um, so I, I, I was aware of it. But back when I started it, I mean, I was on one of the series that kind of, you know, blew the whole thing up in terms of North America was Sailor Moon. So uh, Tuxedo Mask. And, and uh, I mean, it was popular and it was growing back then. And it was it was already big. I don't want to, you know, sound egotistical. I just when Sailor Moon, I know that that was one of the ones to that and Pokemon and. Uh, and so I wasn't aware how huge it was until I did that. And, and once I had done Sailor Moon and, and, and played Tuxedo Mask, it was crazy. I mean, I would get, I would get tons of email and fan mail and it was just insane. I remember uh, at the time my wife and I, we weren't married, but we were together and, and I would just, sometimes I'd be like, I, 
I can't believe how crazy this is. I mean, it's it's I'd probably get more fan mail and more questions and interview requests for that for this stuff than anything I've done. And it's funny because the fandom for Sailor Moon is, is still so strong. I'm a, I'm a Mooney myself, and it's yeah. approaching its uh, its 20th anniversary, and they just announced that they're uh, re-releasing the manga. So everybody is hoping uh, rumors are flying everywhere. I've heard from quote unquote sources that uh, they're trying to get the the anime, whether it's redubbed or re-released or whatever. So that might that might be a new thing that, uh, that possibly could be cool. on your plate. <laughs> now, now, now let's go back a second. You said 20th anniversary. Anniversary? You mean of like when Sailor Moon was launched in Japan? In, in, yes, in Asia, right? originally. Good. Yeah. Because <laughs> okay. I was about to say, wait a minute, it wasn't 20 years ago when I did it, because otherwise that would make me a lot older. <laughs> I, I believe it was um, uh, maybe anywhere from five to seven years after you guys you yeah. guys dubbed it. I don't know, but yeah, it's. I mean, it's going back probably 12 years now, which is still makes me old. Um, but <laughs> but it's not 20. I was like, oh my god. Uh, yeah, I, I was, believe that was the original uh, conception of the manga. In fact. Right. Yeah, 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 but it's. You're right. It's been around. I mean, it's you know going on what 13, 14 years ago, maybe even longer now. Actually, uh, that might even be close to 15 years ago that I did my first episode. You know, uh, so yeah, it's that's crazy. Wow. It is a long time. <laughs> I'm sorry to make you feel old. <laughs> you know what? It's fun. It's the trip down memory lane. It's fun. <laughs> that must have been really surprising, though. Even even now, you're probably getting fan mail a lot from it because it was part of so many people's childhood. And did you expect that it would continue to be so popular? Um, I don't know that you expect anything from this business, but you. Um, I was surprised, and yet... I'm not surprised because when we were in when we were doing it and in the middle of it, it you know as I said it I, I was aware of how big it was and how much fan mail and how many people were you know there was I mean there was internet sites you know something like five hundred thousand websites you know dedicated to Sailor Moon stuff I mean that's massive at one point you know you got the Bare Naked Ladies a, a band from my country mentioning Sailor Moon in one of their hit songs you know it's it, it I, I, you could tell that it was a pretty far-reaching um uh project um but I, I mean at the same time I'm always surprised by anything in this business any anything that becomes successful you know you you can't take it for granted you have to be appreciative and uh and so, you know, from that perspective, yes, I'm, I'm I'm shocked. I still I can't quite believe sometimes when I get fan mail and or when I even bump into, you know, I'll meet new people, you know, because I'm in my late 30s now and I'll meet people that are my age and, and they'll be like, oh, my God, I was such a fan. I can't believe it. And they're like friends. And you're going, really? Like, <laughs> that's crazy. And it, and it is so long ago. But uh, but I am aware how big it is. It, it's pretty crazy. Well, it must be nice for the ego to say that you got to be the heartthrob of uh, young girls everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, as as a drawing, as a picture. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but the voice makes the character come to life. You never know. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, it was a fun, it was a fun show. Uh, dubbing is very different, though, too, than than creating something from scratch. I mean, especially the Rhythma Band. Which is how we did Sailor Moon. We we uh, did we we dubbed Sailor Moon using Rhythma Band. I don't know if you guys have, know what I'm talking about, but um, it's a specific type of dubbing, as opposed to using beeps to to guide you in. Um, you watch uh, a band that uh, projects. It's almost like a um, a rear view projector, and it projects up onto a wall, and there's a line, and when the words hit the line, that's when you speak. Um, so it's very much about, they call it the rhythm of band because it's all about rhythm. It's all about feeling the rhythm of the, the pace of the, of what you're recording. Um, so it's a, it's a, but it's, what's amazing about it is it's incredibly precise. And that's why I, I think too, I, I you know, I, I remember I would see episodes of it and bits and pieces of it. And, and I was always impressed at how well the dubbing was done. And it's kind of curious because I always hear that the dubbing for Sailor Moon was very quick. Uh, you you guys had to pump out episodes really fast. Oh. Was that true? 
Oh yeah. 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 Oh yeah. We were, oh, yeah, I would do, sometimes I'd be in there for, you know, six to eight hours and we'd, we'd you know, just smash through about 10 episodes. Like I honestly, I get letters and I, I don't mean to disappoint people out there who are huge fans. So please <laughs> take it with a grain of salt. But I get letters and questions about things like in episode 63 when, the, and I'm like, I have no clue what you're talking about. No, <laughs> <laughs> like we barely got to digest some of what we were recording. I mean, in the moment we'd always, you know, our director would always say, okay, here's what's going on in the scene. Here's, you know, and you'd always get a sense of the scene anyways, just from what you're reading, but we'd be, we'd be ripping through that stuff so fast that, you know, as soon as I would record an episode, we'd be on to the next one. And so then you just forget. I mean, they start to blur into, into each other. Um, but I do remember a lot of stuff and, you know, so it's not like it was completely disconnected. We were very connected at the time. It's just that we, we did, we ripped through a lot of that stuff fast. I remember doing the movies and, uh, we recorded those movies in like a week. You know, I mean, five days in studio and, you know, it was crazy. I can understand that. I mean, it was so long ago. And even now I have to rewatch the series. I, I'm actually making the co-owner of 91.8 The Fan watch the series with me. He, he's a guy and he's never seen it before. And we're actually at uh, uh, R, the beginning of R with Alan and Anne. So <laughs> ah, yes, my other my alter ego in the show. I actually started as Alan. In the dream, what was it? What was it called? The 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 uh, the, the tree thing. The doom tree. Doom tree, not dream tree. That's it. The doom tree. That's right. I started as Alan, and uh, there was two tuxedo masks before me. Um, a, two good friends of mine, uh, Reno and Toby. Um, and then uh, Reno actually Reno moved to L.A. and that's why he uh, left. And then I, I don't know why what happened with Toby. I, maybe he got busy, or I don't know. But then I took over. And uh, did the bulk of them from that point on. Yeah, I always thought it was interesting uh, to know that those those two characters essentially became one and the same vocally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I hope that uh, I just realized that probably are, came are out. You of say that, are you trying to tell me I didn't have distinct characters? You did <laughs> have distinct characters. That's not what I meant. Oh, now I just dug myself a hole. Alan, Alan was so evil, and the mask is so heroic. It's true. It's true. Tuxedo Mask is uh, I definitely. No idea which one it was. I wish I knew because I'd love to get a copy of it or find it. Um, and one of my favorite episodes of all time was when I was Tuxedo Mask. I actually ended up playing the villain as well in the episode. Um, I don't know if they credited me. I don't know. I can't remember. It was one of those ones where the director, everybody, you know, you get to know each other. And then one day I said, I go, you know, I, I want to be a villain. I want to be a bad guy again. It'd been a while. And so they were like, all right. And they brought me in like the next day and they were like, okay, you're playing the villain and tuxedo mask. And I actually got to kick my own ass in the, in the episode, <laughs> which was fun. <laughs> now I want to go and find that episode. I'll, if I, if no, I, I don't, I don't know which out. I don't know I'll which one it know. is. Here. I don't think I don't think I got credited for it because uh, I don't think I've ever seen it on any like credit lists or anything like that. So I I, I don't remember what it was. I kind of remember what happened in the episode, but I don't really. I have no idea. I'd love to find it because I just love to hear it. I'd love to hear like the you know the progression of the vocals of me beating myself up and you know. <laughs> I, I will definitely listen for that. Hopefully, uh, hopefully I'll be able to tell. <laughs> I don't know because the, the voice was very distinct. It was like a really kind of evil sound, like it was something like that. Because they really, they were really concerned about. Well, we we can't have them sound at all alike. We don't want people to know. And so. Exactly. Well, actually, I think that's a good time to take a break for all you fans out there to start shuffling through your Sailor Moon collection. But don't go too far away because we'll be back with our special guest. So keep it tuned to 91.8 The Fan. Everything you want and nothing you don't. 918 The Fan. We are your grandpa's anime radio station. Faster speed. Everything you want. I'll take a potato chip. <laughs> and eat. And nothing you don't. Hey everybody out there, welcome back to 91.8 The Fan. I am still in the corner with my special guest, he hasn't gone away. Would you like to give us a sign of life? Hello, I'm still alive! That's always a good thing, we like when our guests are alive. <laughs> <laughs> now, obviously we were talking a little bit behind the scenes and we brought up the video game thing, and obviously I want to ask, you know, 
animation and video games. From what I hear, they're completely different because you have so many reaction sounds and sometimes the scripts can be very lengthy. What would you describe is the most different of the two? Um, well, I, essentially voiceover performing is everything is the same. I mean, in terms of where you start from, you're always trying to create a character. So whether it be, sorry about those beeps in the background. It's my emails coming in. I apologize. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I, maybe I could shut off the volume, but then that would probably, would that shut off my volume to you guys? Uh, quite possibly, but it's okay. We yeah, can do so it. why don't we, we'll just ignore that and let's get back <laughs> to the interview. So if you hear a bing sound in the background, that's just my email and I apologize. Um, we can blame uh, it yes. on my phone. <laughs> yes, there you go. Um, so essentially, you know, they're, uh, the, the basis for everything you're doing, whether it be video games or animation, um, you know, you you start with creating a character. So that's the same. Um, the requirements, uh, I don't know. I mean, the only thing different is you're right. It's just reaction stuff. That's that's about the only thing that's different because essentially, I, I mean, we we do we record things in segments for video games, you know, because you have different um, uh, what do they call and they call them they're different uh, adventures or different tasks and stuff like that. So they get broken down that way. So when you get a script, the script is broken down differently in terms of you know you'll have like uh, you'll have the different uh, section segments that'll be titled. Um, whereas in animation, it's typically done, you know, you get a script and so you just, you read it like a story. Um, but, but your recording script is still numbered and sound effects are numbered the same. And so that's, you know, essentially the same. Um, and probably the biggest difference is, yeah, you have to do endless amounts of, um, you know, depending on the video game, death noises or jumping sounds or fighting sounds, and you always have to do short, medium, and long versions of everything. Um, vocally, video games are a little more taxing just when you do that, especially when you do, you know, really, really high adventure oriented stuff, you know, it's like, you know, which has a lot of killing or stuff like that, because then you end up having to do, you know, like I said, you have to do, you know, long death or punched in the throat or, you know, stabbed in the heart and you have to make all those sounds. So that gets a little taxing. But otherwise, I always feel like, to me, at least the way I approach the work is always the same. I'm creating a character. So um, whether it be a video game or, or animation, uh, you know, it's always, okay, what's this guy, you know, what's he trying to do? What's he trying to accomplish? You know, what does he want? It's always from an, you know, an actor standpoint. And I'm sure you've noticed it living in Los Angeles, but it seems like video games have become bigger and bigger there. Um, yeah, they've all, I, I don't know that I'd noticed the difference. I mean, I've always done a lot and, um, uh, you know, they've always been huge. Um, and in fact, you know, the first video game I ever did was probably you know, Resident Evil, uh, Carlos. I mean, it doesn't get much bigger than that. Um, so, uh, I mean, I've done some big ones since Kingdom Hearts is huge. I know it's huge. And, uh, and that was a fun, uh, a real fun project to be part of. Um, uh, you know, getting to, uh, we were, we were hooked up live with people in, in Japan. And, um, so that was kind of cool. We were recording. Um, but, uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I mean, you know, video games have definitely exploded. It's, it's a massive, massive industry, uh, that, you know, rivals or is actually probably bigger than the film industry. I, I don't know what the numbers are now, but I know it's huge. Um, uh, but I, I can't say that I've noticed uh, that it's bigger in LA. I mean, I did a ton back in Toronto. Um, you know, I do a lot out here as well. So, you know, it's, it's a healthy, healthy industry. <laughs> well, comparing it with the film industry, I remember a chart I, I saw quite a while ago, actually, when Avatar just came out and it was comparing the sales of Avatar to, at the time, the latest Call of Duty. I think it was Modern Warfare 2. And they were making the same amount of money with uh wow. I, b I believe call of duty modern warfare was half the uh half the marketing price as well which so so granted they were probably making more money but i thought that was actually kind of interesting yeah yeah it's i mean that's true well but you're also talking about call of duty it was what which which one like number modern warfare 2 so i think maybe the fifth or sixth uh, sixth one yeah. i don't i don't keep track so of too you, many you don't have to, you also don't have to market as much 
when you've already got like it's like Resident Evil or Kingdom Hearts. I mean, they don't have to market now as much because it's already got built in fan sites and built in, you know, followers so they can, you know, uh, I'm sure when they put the first Call of Duty out, they probably marketed like crazy a lot more. And and yeah, with films, you still, you know, the marketing budgets, the P&A budgets are insane. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> you know, you hear you hear the production budget for a film you know, often you can see a movie that's like 20 million bucks and, you know, it can have as much as double the production budget in prints and advertising, you know. That's so, very true. I, I yeah. don't know as much about film as I do about video games. Granted, that's more my my niche, so <laughs> I don't have cable anymore. I'm kind of enclosed uh, in my little hermit <laughs> area. <laughs> Well, you know, but what's interesting with video games, one of the arguments that I've heard over the years from our union and, and stuff, because, you know, I mean, we video games can be massively, massively profitable. And, and uh, you know, over time, as the artists who perform on them, you know, we've kind of felt that it's our, our rates need to be need to sort of reflect that. But one of the arguments from the producers of them and the developers of games is that for every Call of Duty or Resident Evil or Halo that's out there or Kingdom Hearts, um, those companies end up having, you know, 50, 60 titles that don't make their money back con- compared to the development to, de- you know, create the game. And so those Titles like Halo and Resident Evil and Kingdom Hearts, they're, you know, they basically make up for the amount of money that they lose when they when the video games don't work or don't take off or aren't as successful. You know, I mean, that's also producers love to cry. You know, <laughs> yeah. <they're> broke. <laughs> no, we can't possibly pay you any more money. We're broke. We only made four hundred billion dollars on Halo, and we just couldn't possibly pay you any more. You know, Granted, we, I don't think that's where they should make a cut. I mean, with as much that it's put into video games, like with limited editions or with marketing that sometimes doesn't even go anywhere, since most of their audiences are online and you can do simple marketing via online, but some choose not to, uh, it it just seems like that's kind of a silly place to put a cut. But I, you know, I'm kind of biased. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, so am I as a performer. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that, you know, they, they love to argue that, you know, no, it's the game that sells and, you know, it's, we're not as important uh, as the game itself. And I'm like, no, you're absolutely right. The platform is what, you know, it's, it's, it, if, if it works, that truly is what makes something successful. But, you know, if you had crappy performances, probably wouldn't help, you know. I think what makes a game addictive and what makes people want to come back is when it's seamless and flawless and you really get into the characters and, and you, you know, love the performances. It has to be it's – it's an all-in-one. It's like saying – you know, it's like watching a movie and going, wow, that performance was great, but the, you know, the, the camera work was terrible. It was shaky or it wasn't lit well. Well, it doesn't matter how great a performance is. If, if, it, do, if it doesn't all come together and work together well, every department has to be great to make something iconic and, and amazing. So, uh, you know, so I, I don't like to – I'm one of those people that just doesn't believe in selling any area short. You know, I, I think that everybody uh, deserves their accolades uh, when something is successful. You know. I, can, I can definitely get behind that, essentially, because I go back to games or I play games only if I can get, you know, attached to a character, if I can relate to a character. There are games right. that people love that are like have a character that's, you know, s- stone cold and ruthless and wants to kill everything. Well, I don't want to kill everything, right, so right. I don't really want to play that. Right. And it's, I mean, I agree 100 percent. And the people that play those characters, that's probably just, you know, it's just um, it's escapism. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, I want right. to play a character like that because, you, you know, nobody's like that in real. Well, actually, that's not true. There's tons of people that are like that in real life, but <laughs> I prefer not to meet them. Um, but, you know, 99 percent of people that play that stuff, it's because, yeah, it's escapism. And that's what we do. You know, it's fun. It's just, you know, it's and uh, and I mean, and if that character is portrayed poorly, well, it's not as believable to the gamer. The gamer, you know, the person's not going to – they're going to pick a better performance. They're going to pick a game that they go, well, this this game is just as interesting and is well-developed, but I like that performance better. You know, I believe it more. And I think that's truly what it is. It's about escaping into that world and, and you know, and, and uh, getting caught up in that world and then wanting to solve the puzzles and, and kind of feel like you're actually – you know, controlling and, and that that sort of character or that world or, you know, or, or living in it. 
And I love that sort of perspective. I'm I'm kind of curious though. Do you have any video games or animation or commercial or any stuff like that coming up that you want to pimp out to us? Ah, <laughs> um, sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm always working on stuff. Uh, right now, I just finished a pilot for a show called Spyburbia. Uh, I play a character, Jr. It's an awesome uh, script uh, with some amazing people involved. It's a co. It's the first ever animated co-production for Fox. Um, the knock on wood and, uh, you know, all the people out there, please support it. If it ever gets out, um, it's a pilot right now, but hopefully it's going to go. Um, it's, it's supposed to air on Fox and in Canada on global. And it's the first ever co-production between Fox animation and another company. They've never, when it comes to animation, Fox has never, ever co-produced, um, uh, cookie jar is developing it. And uh, it was created by Steven D'Souza. I don't know if you guys know that name from the world of film. Uh, Terminator, Die Hard. He wrote those movies. Ah, nice. See, yeah. see, you had to give me films for, for yeah. it to click. <laughs> so, uh, so it's so the pedigree on the development of it is pretty awesome. The writing is phenomenal. Um, you know, Steven D'Souza created it and wrote it. Um, and we've got some amazing people working on it. Pete Michels, who's uh, director of Family Guy and Simpsons, is the director of it. Um, so it's and it's it's it looks fantastic. Um, it's it's pretty cool. It's it's a really cool concept. It's about a family that lives in suburbia. They're actually not a family. They're um, super spies. Um, and then their cover is that they live in suburbia and that they are supposed to be pretending to be a family. Um, but the mother and father and brother and sister, none of them are related to each other. Um, uh, and, uh, the mom and dad actually can't stand each other. The brother and sister are actually kind of secretly having an affair. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. And, but they're, but they're, but it's, you know, it's, it's comical. It's kind of outrageous. It's funny. And then there, what's cool about it is, that we, you know, the whole concept is that there's this two worlds that these characters live in. They live in the suburban world where, you know, the kids have to go to school, but they're really 25 year old super spies who just happen to be short and have squeaky voices. And that's why their cover is in, you know, that they're supposed to be 15 year old kids in high school. Um, but then there's these action sequences where we're out saving the world or stopping, you know, some you know, evil super spy. And so it's really cool. It's actually very cool. The, the pilot script that we, uh, we recorded about a month ago was, was awesome. And it's funny and great, an amazing cast. Actually, one of the, uh, the woman who, uh, plays the mom is Susan Roman, who was, uh, Sailor Jupiter on, uh, Sailor Moon. So we go way back. Um, yeah, some great people on it. Very cool. That sounds exciting. And hopefully we'll, we'll see it soon. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, hopefully. Knock on wood. <laughs> Just in case. Nice. <laughs> knocking on my head, but it's much more hollow, and it's much, more, it's much more wood-like. That's why I always knock on it. Now, for any upcoming projects that you can't really talk about right now or will come down the pipe a little bit later, do you update anywhere on the Internet? Do you social network or anything like that? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have a website. My best friend uh, designed this my website years ago when he he's now a you know awesome, amazing top web designer and you know and I was lucky enough we were best friends and when he was getting into it he was like dude let me make you a website and I was like okay sure and so you know I send him updates from time to time stuff like that but no nah, I'm not really one of those uh, guys that kind of pimps out my stuff. You know, I may, I, maybe I should be, <laughs> I just, uh, you know, I, I just kind of go with the flow. IMDB, you can check IMDB for stuff. Actually, I think Spyburbia is up on IMDB now. And, um, you know, I, I don't really, I don't really make announcements. I don't have a fan page on Facebook. Um, you know, uh, I'm, people keep saying I should, but I don't know. <laughs> well, if there's anything you want us to let the fans know, we will definitely do so. We're 24 <laughs> seven. Awesome. Awesome. And do you do any events? Have you done the convention circuit at all? I have not, actually. I've been invited to a couple, um, but I, I have, I've never actually been. Um, I'd love to do them. 
I don't know. They just never kind of work out. A couple in the past when I've been invited, uh, sometimes the, the dates wouldn't work out because I'd be working on something else. And um, and then I've been invi- invited to a few that are like, you know, where you, across the country or something like that. And they're like, well, oftentimes they don't have the money to pay for you to come there. So it's like, you know, to spend a thousand oh, bucks. bad if, convention. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you go, you go. Hey, I would love to come and you know meet fans and and support the projects and stuff like that. But I'm not going to drop two thousand bucks of my own money to stay at a hotel and you know pay for a flight to to go there. You know what I mean? It's so that's happened a few times where they're like, "We'd love you to come." I'm like, "Hey, I'd love to come. I'd love to do it." You know? And then they're like, "But here's the deal." And I go, "Okay, but then I'm probably not going to be able to make it." <laughs> yeah, that's actually good on you. I would I if it, a convention invites you out, you you essentially, you know, they pay for your room, they pay for your flight. Whether they pay for your food or not, that's that can be on the fence. Yeah, but it's yeah, like yeah. they invite you out. I yeah, yeah. I mean, I've in you know in the past when projects are being released, I've had uh, where the company will pay for it because they want to promote the the project. Um, but like I said, it's so odd that any time that happened, I was always unavailable. I was always working on something else, so I've never really done it. I've never gone, done the the convention. I've, I've actually never been to a single one. Um, and I and you know and and not by choice. I mean, I'm I'm always willing to do it and go. You know, but it's it's been ironic, even when they are willing to pay or bring me out or, you know, or even if it's local, I've always just been like, damn, I can't make it. I'm I'm shooting something or I'm recording that day or, you know, or I'm out of town. And um, so it's been odd. I'm, I'm whole, I'd am love to do it. I'm, it's so funny. And all the stuff that I've done, you know, that that is so convention oriented, uh, I've never actually made it out. And I keep thinking, I got to do one one day. I got to see what it's all about. And I have so many friends that do it. Like I'm good buddies with you know, uh, Billy West, who's on Futurama and Maurice LaMarche and Phil Lamar and, you know, tons of like, you know, superstar voiceover guys like uh, Jim Cummings, who's Winnie the Pooh. And, you know, and they've all been to the conventions. My, my, one of my best friends is Carlos Alves Rocky, who was, um, you know, he's done a million things. Uh, Rocco's Modern Life is, uh, you know, he was in Happy Feet and they, they've all done it. And they tell me about it. And I'm like, ah, damn, I want to go, man. I wanna... <laughs> it sounds like fun. <laughs> well, maybe one day we'll see you at a convention. Hopefully soon. <laughs> I would love that. Yeah, that would be a blast. (laughs) And since we're nearing the end of our time together, I'm just kind of curious if you'd be willing to participate in a 91.8 The Fan tradition. Uh Uh-oh. Well, you haven't told me what it is, so I can't – it's hard to say yes or no. (laughs) (laughs) We ask everybody if they'd be willing to do a radio bump for us. Yeah, of course. Awesome. Here's the catch. We do it live on air. (laughs) Oh, yay. (laughs) <laughs> you can tell he's thrilled <laughs> with no no copy in front of me <laughs> no copy we can type it to you though <laughs> all right what do, what, do, what do you want me to do Basically, look, look, I'm a tra- look i'm a trained seal oh, 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 oh. okay let's do it basically we ask if you could say hello my name is you insert your name i do this you can insert characters or you're an actor or whatever you want to put there and you're tuned into 91.8 the fan so I, you literally want me to say hi. My name is insert name here. Or no, you actually, no, you, you insert. Joking, I'm joking. <laughs> and you come on. <laughs> I've, I've had someone do a bump like that. I've been through that. <laughs> uh, not that stupid. Come on. <laughs> uh, my name's Vince. Uh, I do voices. Okay, let's do. What do you want? So, what do we, we want me to say again? You want to do? Uh, Hi, I'm Vince Carraza. I've uh, performed in a whole bunch of different stuff, and uh, name them, and then say, and you're listening to ninety ninety one point eight The Fan. You're tuned into ninety one point eight. Ooh, the fan. it's very specific. Wow, I just felt that whip crack. Oh, <laughs> and here I didn't think I was. I was the very mean director. I'm, I'm, joking. Get I'm, joking. <laughs> I'm joking with you. You guys are slave drivers. I we try. This, we this try. is the hardest, hardest interview I've ever done. <laughs> but whenever you're ready, we can do take one. <laughs> All right. Tell me when. Now. Like right now? Yeah, right now. Just messing with you. God, you're so gullible. <laughs> I am. I'm, I'm funny and I'm the butt of everybody's jokes. What do you expect? <laughs> you're like right now. Oh, you're so cute. Okay, ready? <laughs> Hi, I'm Vince Carrazza, and I've been the voice of Tuxedo Mask on Sailor Moon, Alden on Braceface, 
Shika Dance on Ace Ventura Pet Detective. Uh, I've been in Kingdom Hearts, um, tons of stuff. And you are tuned into 91.8, The Fan. See, that wasn't that hard. Got on your first take. <laughs> Whew. Please, can you send that to my agents? I, I so can they, totally send that to your agent. <laughs> just, I'm joking. I, so I, guys, I, yeah, I know, I know. So you guys, I can get it in one take. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything else you'd like to tell the listeners out there um no i bet you they're probably bored to tears they've, they've been like wow this guy can talk man his poor wife how does she put up with him <laughs> actually i see a lot of lows vincent's funny etc cetera, etc cetera. so <laughs> i think they i think they're enjoying the fact you're making fun of me <laughs> uh, uh that's sweet that's sweet man listen uh i am nothing without the fans man I, we 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 are nothing without people enjoying the work we do and appreciating the work we do i love and appreciate every person out there that has ever sent me a message or told me that they enjoyed what i did i mean um you know uh, as an acting coach of mine once said in a little bit of a crass way so i'll, I'll try not to say it on the air but he once said you know acting for yourself is called masturbation so you know you have to do it for audiences we do it so we you know i i do it to share with with other people and uh so the fans mean the world to me and, and people when somebody says that they enjoyed what i did that's you know it's it's so it's uh it's really um it's uh important so i appreciate the, all the fans out there well, thank you so much for coming on to the show to talk with us today. It was a lot of fun, even though I got made fun of. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was not making fun of you. I was just oh, trying no, to it's cool. It. I, I, I like the fun. It's It makes it entertaining. It makes it so it's not in, you're not just answering yes or no. I like that. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> thank you for, for this. And for anybody out there who missed any of the interview, don't fret. You can catch it on the website within the next few days. So keep it tuned to your favorite site and station, 91.8 The Fan. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. You guys rock.